Good morning. It's good to see every one of you this morning. Uh, you might notice it looks a little bit different in here. Uh, I was thinking as the carpet was being put down this week, if you would have asked us previously what the carpet looked like in here, this is probably what we would have described it looking as. Uh, but, but now that you actually see the difference between the old and the new, it's really quite striking. Uh, this is just tea. I'm getting over uh, a cold, so I'm very cautious to set this down anywhere at this point. So I'm just going yeah, to hold on to it. I don't know how I'm going to preach or play piano, but this is going to be safe somehow. Uh, but it's good to see everyone. If you are visiting with us this morning, uh, we welcome you. We are glad that you are here. Uh, we have uh, a couple of brief announcements uh, before we get started with our singing. Uh, we are in the process of replacing our floors, uh, so Lord willing, this week, uh, the rest of the building will be done. Uh, so hopefully when you come back next Sunday, uh, it'll look really different in here, hopefully. Uh, we will see. But because of the flooring going down, we are not going to have Bible study on Wednesday. Uh, it's just going to be too chaotic in here. Uh, so uh, again, Lord willing, next Wednesday, we will pick that uh, back up there. Uh, also, next week, uh, Women of Grace will be meeting next Tuesday uh, for their annual trip to Dairy Queen. Uh, so if you haven't ever been to a Women of Grace meeting before, what better time to start coming than the time that they go to Dairy Queen once a year? Uh, so they're going to meet here. Uh, they're going to go over some of the uh, plans that they have for the coming months and the ministries they have going on here, uh, and then they're going to head to Dairy Queen. Uh, if you have helped out with Vacation Bible School, uh, Bill and I would love to hear from you. Uh, I know I gave several of you surveys to fill out, uh, and many of you have returned them to me. Uh, but if I did not give you a survey last week, I have them on the table out in the lobby uh, and if you could grab one of those, if you helped out, uh, I don't care in what capacity you helped out. We want to hear from everyone uh, and make the adjustments while they're still fresh in our minds uh, to make improvements for next year. And then finally, uh, the final announcement for this morning is two weeks from today, uh, Sunday, and I, it's not July 18th, it's July 17th, uh, so the date is wrong. It is Sunday, two weeks from today. Uh, we will have our quarterly members meeting. Uh, to uh, go over all the uh, reports from the past quarter, go over the financials, especially with all the renovations going on. Uh, but if you are a member here, 
uh, please make it a point to stay after the service in two weeks uh, for our quarterly members meeting. Uh, with that, we are going to get to worship this morning. If you want to turn in your hymnals to hymn number 63, uh, by the time we're done, we're also going to learn a new song this morning. Uh, but first, would you please stand as we sing uh, with hymn number 63, Praise Him, Praise Him.
seated. It's a new month, so we're going to learn a new song this morning. Uh, and it's fitting for where we are at in the book of Hebrews this morning, where we are told not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, but as I thought of us as a church and where we're at uh, and the grace of God that's been shown to us in the unity that we have with one another, uh, I thought that this would be a great song uh, to introduce this month. Uh, and so if you listen to it from the, the link I posted on Facebook, join us right away. Uh, but if not, join us uh, for the second verse. This is Oh How Good It Is, taken right from the Psalms. morning. What an 
another beautiful day the Lord has given us. We'll read this morning, if you care to follow, in Psalms 119, beginning at the 113th verse and uh, reading through the 128th verse. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, for I will keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my hope. Hold me up, and I shall be safe, and I shall observe your statutes continually. You rejoice all those who stray from your statutes, for their deceit is falsehood. You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. I have done justice and righteousness. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Be surety for your servant for good. Do not let the proud oppress me. My eyes fail from seeking your salvation and your righteous word. Deal with your servant according to your mercy and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for you to act, O Lord, for they have regarded your law as void. Therefore, I love your commandments more than gold, yes, than fine gold. Therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right. I hate every false way. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for your word. You tell us in your word that it's truth, and we seek that in this world that we live in. We uh, pray that we as a nation might uh, seek truth always. Lord, we uh, pray for members of our congregation who uh, have spatial health needs at this time, that you would be with them, give them the peace that passes all understanding, and uh, give them uh, grace to weather the storm. Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we continue the service, that everything that is said and done, that you would find pleasing. Lord, that uh, you would guide each of our thoughts, give us hearing ears, understanding hearts, and willing hearts to do your will. We'll give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. If you would, please stand, take out a hymnal, and just turn number 385. Please stand.
greet one another, Stone's Church will be dismissed. On Thursday, I was contemplating calling Brother Larry up and having him on standby for this morning because you never know how these colds run their course and all that. But then I was like, wait, he's going to want this passage that I'm preaching today, and I don't want to give up this passage I'm preaching today. And so out of my, uh, out of my self, uh, you know, uh, what I wanted, I decided to keep it for my own and power through. Uh, but last summer, uh, when I was having lunch with some other pastors here in town, uh, I told them that I was preparing to start the book of Hebrews uh, when we wrapped up in our current series in the Psalms. And Tim White, uh, the pastor of Winchester Baptist over there on 522, a, a great friend and fellow co-laborer here in town, uh, Tim gave me this look like, are you crazy? You know, you haven't even been there, you know, just over three years, and you're already starting one of the most theologically dense books of the entire, you know, uh, Bible. Uh, you know, your people are going to revolt. Uh, and you haven't yet, or at least not to my face, maybe privately you are, you know, but, but uh, I, I think in the bonds of unity, uh, you, you haven't really. Uh, and I must say to your credit that you've been incredibly uh, patient with me as we've worked our way through the book of Hebrews these past eight months, uh, and uh, uh, especially these past couple months in which the author of Hebrews has looked at Jesus' role of great high priest from a multitude of angles. It's easy for us to become bogged down by these weighty issues and lose track of where we are in the book and why the book was even written in the first place. It'd be easy to miss the forest for the trees, so to speak. This morning, however, we reemerge from the forest. After nine and a half chapters of meat that we've chewed on, we now begin the final section of Hebrews, one that takes what we learned about Jesus' supremacy uh, over all things and lays out some practical applications as to how we live accordingly in light of who Jesus is and what he's done. Would you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10? Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. When we first started Hebrews back in October, uh, we did a broad overview of the book in the first week. Uh, October 24th, 2021, we looked at the background and broad overview of the book. Uh, we hopped in our Boeing 747 and we went up to cruising altitude so we could get the entire lay of the land. That, yeah, we could see, well, there's a forest here and there are some plains here, but, uh, you know, we just wanted to get the big picture of the book. And while we were up there, we noted how the book of Hebrews uh, was written to Jewish believers who sought to hide uh, under the umbrella of Judaism in order to avoid trials, tribulations, and persecution. We also saw uh, how there are three main points to the book, three themes that were going to be found throughout. First, and the main theme, is that Jesus is better. Jesus is the better revelation of God. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus' priesthood is better than the Levitical priesthood. And that's because the new covenant that he inaugurated is better than the old covenant uh, that was set forth on Mount Sinai. And this is the diamond that the author of Hebrews has held up to the light and examined at every angle. No matter how we slice it, Jesus is better. We were to sum up the book of Hebrews in three words. It could be summed up with Jesus is better. And the other two themes that we saw in the book of Hebrews flowed out of the first. Second, because Jesus is better, we ought to stick with him. To the original audience, it was living for Jesus despite whatever circumstances would come their way. And for us today, it's the same thing. It's, it's nothing really has changed. Sure, we might not be looking to hide under the umbrella of Judaism, but yet we still face pressure to conform to the world. 
We don't want to stand out. We don't want, to, we don't want people uh, have the, have people point their fingers at us. So we seek to blend in. We just want to be, you know, among the crowd. But what comfort and what security can we find in the world when the comfort and security we have in Jesus is better? And so the third theme of Hebrews is that because Jesus is better, because we ought to stick with Jesus, we must encourage one another to that end. A lone wolf mentality is not suitable for a follower of Jesus. We won't thrive if we remove ourselves from fellowship with one another. We are in this together. And we see the evidences of that here at Blue Ridge. And it is a joy to be a pastor at a church uh, in which fellowship thrives. It's one of the reasons why I joyfully picked the song I did to be the new song for this month. Though how good it is when the family of God dwells together in spirit, in faith, and unity. And as we turn to Hebrews 10... Verses 19 through 25, as we begin the final section of the book, we're actually going to see these three themes come up in our passage this morning in each of the three commands the author gives in this passage. This morning, we will see that because Jesus is better than everything that has come before him, let us live accordingly. I invite you to follow along as I read, starting in verse 19. The author writes, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer? Heavenly Father, we rejoice in another day to gather together as your people, those whom you have called to represent you in the world, not to hide, but to let our light shine before men. Would your spirit encourage us through your word this morning? And may we in turn encourage one another to live in such a way that is pleasing to you. Would he prepare our hearts and minds to hear and understand what he has revealed to us in your word? We pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Because Jesus is better than everything that has come before him, let us live accordingly. The author begins in our passage this morning with the word therefore uh, in verse 19. In verses 19 through 21, the author summarizes and wraps up everything that he's examined up until this point. Therefore, brethren... In light of all we talked about, because of all the ways that Jesus is better, as a direct consequence of who he is and what he's done, pay attention. Because what we believe should impact how we live. And in particular, the author of Hebrews draws our attention to two things. First, he says in verse 19 that we have boldness to enter the holiest, by the blood of Jesus, and his flesh is a new and living way through the veil. We've talked about that a lot these past few weeks as we've talked about Jesus as our great high priest, his ministry in the true tabernacle, the one not made with hands. We read in Hebrews 9, verse 12, that not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. And so as as the author uh, says that we have boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, we we think back to the holy of holies in the temple uh, and how it was the innermost part of the temple uh, under the Mosaic law. 
It was separated from the rest of the temple by this thick, heavy, very tall veil or curtain. And only the high priest could enter through the veil once a year on the Day of Atonement. That veil kept the Israelites away and was a symbol of their separation uh, uh, from God. They couldn't just mosey on in to the presence of God. There was that veil in the way, and there was one Israelite that could enter God's presence once a year. There was something distinct about the holiness of God, that righteousness of God, that these sinful Israelites couldn't enter his presence because of their sin. But at the moment Jesus died, we're told in Matthew 27, verse 51, that the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Jesus did away with that line of separation. And now all who believe in him can boldly and with confidence go before God. There's no longer a veil in the temple. There's really no longer a temple there in Jerusalem. Jesus tore down that veil. That wall of separation has been, has been broken down. And now we, as believers, can have a boldness to enter into God's presence through Jesus our Savior. You dare not have that boldness or confidence in the temple. God would have struck you dead if you entered his presence in that way. But the body and blood of Jesus, that which we will remember before our time is through this morning, made it, the body and blood made it possible for us to have a friendship with God. Indeed, it's the only way for us to have a friendship with God. And the second aspect to which the author of Hebrews draws our attention is that we have a high priest over the house of God. Excuse me, this Abacare cup keeps this tea super hot. Oh. <clears throat> uh, this brings us back to the author's teaching in chapter 3 that we have this high priest over the house of God uh, where we are called God's house and how Jesus was superior to Moses because Jesus was the one who built the house and Jesus was faithful as a son over the house. And so in light of all this, in light of all the author has written up until this point, he then goes on in verses 22 through 25 to tell us there are three things that we ought to do as a result. It's not sufficient to know the things of God. We must then live in light of them. Both are necessary for a successful Christian life. The Christian life is not just about doing, it's also about knowing. But on the flip side, it's not just about knowing, it's about doing. The successful Christian life marries the two and results in a life of faith. He gives, the author gives three commands in verses 22 and through 25, and all of them begin with the words, let us. And at first glance, these might seem more like suggestions in English uh, rather than commands. After all, commands are usually issued in the second person. Uh, we look at someone and say, do this and don't do that. I know I'm asking you to think back to elementary school when you learned about the uh, different grammatical persons, the different uh, persons in grammar lessons. First person is I or we. Second person is you or y'all. Or if you're from where I'm from in southeast Pennsylvania, we say yous. What are you guys doing? Uh, or we have third person, he, she, they. And commands or imperatives in English uh, are usually given in the second person. Because we are telling someone else, we're telling the person we're talking to to do something. Take out the trash. Quit jumping on the couch. Make your bed. As parents, we have a whole long list of these second-person commands that we are ready to go you know, at a moment's notice. But here, the command is in the first person, specifically the first person plural. We don't have a specific way to note this in English the way the Greek does. The author is including himself in this command. After all, he's writing to brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, just like he had. In fact, didn't he just call them brethren in verse 19, as he has throughout the book? And so as we're, we look at each of these commands, may there be no doubt about it, even though the English is a little bit different for us. These aren't suggestions. The author isn't seeking permission. Oh, let us do this. No, he's not seeking permission 
These aren't an if-you-feel-like-it proposition. For those who have believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of their sins, for those who have been brought near to God by the blood of Christ, this is what we ought to do. And as we work our way through them, we see that they parallel uh, the three themes that we've observed in Hebrews from the beginning. The first command is found in verse 22. The author writes, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The author tells us, Let us draw near. We just read in verses 19 and 20, let alone the past few chapters, that Jesus has made it possible for us to draw near to God. So let us do it. Jesus' purification of sins through his blood has sprinkled our hearts from an evil conscience. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. And whereas before we couldn't approach God, we couldn't have a friendship with God because our sins separated us from him, now Jesus has paid the price for those sins and we have been cleansed. You see, we deserved God's wrath. God's displeasure, displeasure with sin, warrants eternal separation from him. But Jesus, the sinless son of God, took on flesh to face that wrath so that we wouldn't need to. His shed blood was the price paid for our sins, and that's what we read uh, in verse 17 of chapter 2, that Jesus had to be made like his brethren so that he could be uh, made uh, he could be made propitiation for the sins of the people. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 13 and 14, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has ba- made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. The author of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, what they're saying is that now that Jesus' work is complete, now that we can draw near to God, let us do so. And let us do so, as the author says, in full assurance of faith. The words full assurance translate a single Greek word that means a state of complete certainty. When we believe in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, unable to find that forgiveness on our own. We have access to God, the one who made the universe and all that is in it, the one who is sovereign over all things. You and I, as believers, have access to God. May we not let shame or guilt or feelings of unworthiness prevent or prohibit us from coming before our Heavenly Father. Jesus already did the heavy lifting The hard work of being made right with God has already been done. Now, instead of shrinking back from God or feeling guilt over not living for him the way that we ought to in the past, he desires that we draw near to him. And when we draw near to him, we should have every confidence that he will be with us. As we read in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 8, draw near to God. Many of you know this, draw near to God and what? He will draw near to you. There's no uncertainty in James's mind. It's not submit a request to God and he'll get back to you within seven to ten business days. Or draw near to God and depending on how badly you screwed it up this time, maybe he'll respond to you. Maybe he'll extend some comfort your way. By no means, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. What a privilege and blessing it is to be a child of God, to be called uh, as his own through the blood of Jesus. Many people in this world are confident. They trust in their own abilities. They trust in their wealth and financial security. They trust other people. But we as believers, we have as the object of our trust, our belief, the sovereign Lord over all creation. Who Jesus is and what he has done is everything. May we not shrink back from him, but rather let us draw near. 
Because Jesus is better than everything that has come before him, let us live accordingly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the second command the author of Hebrews gives to that end is found in verse 23. He says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. If the first command dealt with the greatness of Jesus and his work, that we can draw near because of Jesus, this second command deals with the fact that we ought to stick with him. Let us hold fast the confession of our, of our hope without wavering. The NIV translates it as, let us hold unswervingly to the hope. That's a good word. Let us, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. We ought to adhere firmly to our confession. Isn't this one of the problems that the original audience faced and that we face today? They weren't adhering firmly to Jesus. They wanted the benefits of Jesus' ministry. They wanted the benefits of his blood without the difficulty that often comes with it. They wanted, and I think they had, eternal life and a relationship with God. That is all of grace. Eternal life is God's gracious gift through faith. But because this world is at odds with God, when we align ourselves with God, we will stick out like a sore thumb. And the word of God promises us that we will have trouble because of it. We look at Jesus' own words in John 16, verse 33, where he says, talking to his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. Don't be surprised if trials and tribulations and persecutions come your way. People are going to think you're odd for following me. Don't be shocked. In this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulation. The world isn't going to like us. That shouldn't shock us. We should be shocked if the world doesn't have a problem with us. But our duty as followers of Jesus is to make sure that they don't like us for the right reasons. There's a big difference there. They should hate us because we stand up for the righteousness of God and not because we are ungracious and unloving and judgmental. That's a big difference difference. But as Jesus goes on to say in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus has already been victorious over the world, over sin, over death itself. And sure enough, back in Hebrews 10, after the command to hold fast in verse 23, we read why we ought to hold fast. For he who promised is faithful. He's already overcome the world. What else does he have to prove to us? If he's overcome the world through his death, burial, and resurrection, he'll be faithful to whatever else he has promised his children. And when we hold fast our confession, when we remain steadfast in our convictions from the word of God, when we're always ready to give a defense to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in us, God is faithful to his promises. But again, as that passage from 1 Peter 3 continues, may we give that defense with meekness and fear not with a heavy hand, not with judgment, but with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, for not blending in with the morality system of the world, when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. God is faithful to deliver us from all trial, tribulation, and persecution. He's faithful to deliver us into his kingdom with all blessings and rewards for our faithfulness to him. He has promised the crown of righteousness to those who look forward to his return. That's 2 Timothy 4, verse 8, where Paul writes that there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. We'll talk about that day in a minute here. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Brothers and sisters, we have every reason to stick with Jesus. We have every reason to hold fast the confession of our hope, 
that when people come up, to an, uh, come up to us and ask, why are you so odd? Why are you so different? We can say, I'll tell you why. Let me tell you about Jesus. And let us do so with meekness and gentleness and winsomeness that the Spirit would, would bring them to life as well. We have every reason to hold fast that confession. There's no one greater than he is. There's no one superior to him. He has outranked and outworked everyone and everything else. And as we've seen throughout the book so far, the only proper response to the grace we found in Jesus is to live accordingly, to live in light of that grace. And one of the most surefire ways of accomplishing that goal is the role that we play in one another's lives. Because Jesus is better than everything that has come before him, let us live accordingly. And the third and final command the author gives us in this passage, which parallels the third theme of Hebrews, is found in verse 24 and 25. He writes, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters, one of the primary ways we can be sure to live like Jesus is through mutual encouragement in the faith. If we want to hold fast to Jesus, and if we want others to do the same, we must encourage one another to that end. It is difficult to have a growing, vibrant spiritual life if we don't live in community and fellowship with one another. One of the wings of the modern American church has this notion that I love Jesus, but I hate the church. If you've never heard anyone say that, you, I, I have from multiple people. I love Jesus, but I hate the church. I hate organized religion. Jesus would hate the state of the church today. Now, to be clear, there are things done under the banner of the church or in the name of Jesus that bring great reproach upon his name. I do not condone that uh, for a moment. I'm not dismissing those that have legitimate biblical concerns about attitudes and actions that are sadly all too often found within bodies of, lo of the local church. But we cannot say that we love Jesus and hate the church. That makes as much sense as saying 1 plus 1 equals 53. You can't love Jesus and hate his body. You can't love Jesus and hate his bride. It's not possible. You can't love Jesus and look down upon those he came to save. To love Jesus the way we are called includes loving our brothers and sisters in him and encouraging them within the confines of a local church. And if there is corruption and unrighteousness that has found its way inside the bodies of a local church, then doing the righteous thing in meekness and gentleness and exposing that and bringing, to, bringing it to light. But what we can't say is, I love Jesus, but man, are his people idiots. I can't stand them. I don't want to go to church. They're full of hypocrites. But yet you're the one that refuses to go and encourage them to be better. Like, I, I don't understand that. If you show me a believer who isn't engaged and active in a local church to the extent that God has called them to be, then I will show you a believer who has placed a limit on their spiritual growth. We need each other. This right here, our gathering like this, what we do here on Sunday mornings and during Sunday school on Wednesday mornings or you know, the past couple weeks where we've had opportunities to work together and move things around the church, this is like the lifeblood of our spiritual life. This is what encourages us and, and keeps us in fellowship with one another. And I know there are flaws here because I don't need to look any further than the mirror to see the flaws in our assembly here. And so we must consider one another to stir up love and good works. And in verse 25, the author goes on to describe what that looks like with two participles, one negative, one positive. He writes, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. How are we to do that? One, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and two, but exhorting. In the NIV, we read, not giving up meeting together, 
but encouraging. He calls us to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. No wonder these Jewish believers were being picked off by the world, the flesh, and the devil. They removed themselves from the primary support system a believer has. Our meetings together are not optional. Sunday mornings, the, the time that we have set aside to meet together, this is not an optional gathering you know, time. This is essential. We've seen firsthand what happens when people no longer make church a priority. And it shouldn't be shocking or surprising. God didn't design us to be isolated or secluded. In the past two, two and a half years, even unbelievers have suffered crises of mental health when alone, when stuck in isolation without the, without the interaction of other unbelievers. Why should we expect as believers a different outcome from a spiritual perspective when it comes to us today? In contrast to neglecting one another, we are to exhort or encourage one another. And there is no substitute to doing this in person. This word exhort or encourage means precisely that, to instill someone with courage. To hand them courage on a silver platter. I see you are discouraged, you are lacking courage. Here is some courage. Let me encourage you. Let me instill a sense of courage within you. This world is going to be hostile towards us. And any advances we make for the kingdom of God, it would be easy for us to grow weary or lose heart. So we need one another to fill up our tanks of courage. This isn't something easily done on our own. And it's all the more striking that the verse ends with one final exhortation. Do this so much the more as you see the day approaching. And I understand this capital D day, at least it's capitalized in the New King James, to refer to the day of Jesus. Or as we uh, more commonly refer to it around here, we could say it's the rapture. And regardless, the, the point is an important one. We can't allow our encouragement to fizzle out over time. If anything, we need to ramp it up and increase it as time goes on. This world isn't improving and sure, there are moments in history when societies bend towards righteousness or an evil that has been in place for decades or centuries has been righted, at least in part. But to see this world from a biblical perspective is to know that whatever victories are had in the here and now along the way, they pale in comparison to the general trajectory of the world towards evil and unrighteousness. We must continually and constantly encourage one another to live their lives for Jesus as ones who represent him on the earth. Because Jesus is better than everything that has come before him, let us live accordingly. Let us draw near to God. Let us hold fast our confession, and let us consider one another. These three commands look back upon the whole of Hebrews up until this point, and they open, open up the final major section of the book. He also perfectly summarized the three main themes we find in Hebrews, that Jesus is greater. Because he is greater, we ought to stick with him. And, and the primary way we can stick with him is encouraging one another. And Lord willing, in three weeks, we will begin chapter 11 and spend some weeks looking at how these principles were at work in the lives of the Old Testament believers. And our brother Larry Weber will handle one of those weeks on July 31st, Lord willing, uh, we will see how the faith of these Old Testament saints, their belief in God, led them to draw near to him, to hold fast to him, even in uncertain and unknown circumstances. And while we still have a few months to go in the book, we will definitely begin to see a transition to the practical outworking of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. But before we close out chapter 10, we'll first see what happens if we neglect these commands if we refuse to live accordingly. It's been a couple months since we've had a warning passage in, in the book of Hebrews. It's been since chapter 6, so we're about due for one. And so uh, this week we look at these commands, and next week, Lord willing, we have the passage which says, what happens if we tell God no? Author of Hebrews, we know who you are. You know, we today don't, but they did back then. Uh, you know, we know what you're commanding us. We know what God expects of us. What happens if we say no? No. 
We'll get to that next week. But may we not uh, be a people for whom these warning passages apply. May we not entertain the notion of avoiding these commands the author has given to us today. As we're gathered here this morning, as we prepare to celebrate the bread and the cup, remembering Jesus' broken body and shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins, let us draw near to God. Jesus satisfied God's wrath against our sin, something we could never do on our own, regardless of how hard we tried or how dutifully we worked. Jesus made peace with God possible. Jesus made a friendship with God possible. What greater sacrifice or greater display of love is necessary for us to see? What could we possibly be waiting for to live in light of the grace and mercy shown us? And so as we partake, let us reflect and remember together that we, we may be conformed in the image of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, three simple and straightforward commands, yet how often we fall short of them. We thank you that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If there ever was an appropriate time to reflect upon our unfaithfulness, surely it is now. As we turn our attention to the bread and the cup, these symbols that you have designed to focus our attention on the price paid for our sins, would your spirit help us to identify and confess the areas of our lives that do not line up with your righteousness and your word? May we no longer carry them or feel their guilt, but rather the peace and forgiveness that you long to give us. We thank you for Jesus, who made that peace and forgiveness possible. We pray this in his name. Amen. If you would turn in your hymnals to hymn number 315. As we prepare for the bread and the cup, hymn 315, and stand as the deacons come forward. Rock of Ages. Rock of Ages. seated. And as we do prepare our hearts and minds for the bread and the cup, I want to read briefly from 1 John 4. In 1 John 4, starting in verse 7, we read, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does, does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There in verse 10 John says that Jesus was sent as a propitiation for our sins. Jesus satisfied God's wrath against our sins. And oftentimes as we go throughout our days and our weeks, we lose sight of that. We lose sight of the incredible price paid 
so that we could be forgiven and that we could have peace with God. And God, knowing that we are a forgetful people, instituted two signs, two symbols, two ordinances, if you will, to help us remember and symbolize the work of Jesus on our behalf. And one of those symbols uh, is behind me and in front of you this morning, the bread and the cup. This is one of these ways that we remember the price paid for our sins. And the Bible says that as we remember the body uh, broken for us and the, uh, the blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins, the New Testament tells us not to partake in an unworthy manner. Don't approach these flippantly. Don't think, eh, I can grab crackers at Martin's, I can grab grape juice at Walmart, no big deal. No, this is more than that for now. We remember and we reflect on the body and blood of Jesus. And part of taking this seriously, part of taking the bread and the cup in a worthy manner is coming before God with a clean heart and a clean conscience. And so I want to take a moment and let you all in the quietness of your own heart go before the Lord. Draw near in full assurance of faith, confessing your sins to him, confessing that you know there are ways that you don't even know you sin, that you don't even know you transgressed his righteousness and holiness, that you are glad that Jesus died on the cross to forgive you for those things. So take a moment in the quietness of your own hearts and minds and go before our Father through the work of our great high priest. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, as he was eating dinner with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it and blessed it and said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you.
as we partake together, remember the body of Jesus broken for you. Let us eat. After dinner, he took the cup, and after blessing, and he said, This is my blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drink of it, all of you. As we partake together, remember the blood of Jesus shed for the propitiation of your sins. Let us drink. Would you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy that we have to pause and remember and reflect upon the death of your Son on the cross for our sins. His body was broken, his blood was shed, not just by the hands of men, but by your holy and eternal will for the forgiveness of our sins. May this serve as a reminder for us, as you intended it to, that we were bought at a price, and we are to therefore glorify you in our bodies and in our spirits, which are yours. And now may the God who did not even hold back his very own son but handed him over for us all, provide you with every good thing you need in order to do his will and do in you what pleases him. And all of God's people said, amen. Please fellowship with one another as you leave.
Savior.